Good afternoon, and welcome to the Betsy and Wally Stern Policy Center here at Unset Institute. I'm John Walters, Hudson's Chief Operating Officer. Hudson Institute's mission is to promote American leadership and global engagement for a secure, free, and prosperous future. We develop policy solutions by understanding the national good beyond the limitations of conventional thinking. Today, we are honored to have with us Senator Rick Scott. It's my pleasure to welcome him here at Hudson Institute. He will discuss the great power competition between the U.S. and China with Hudson's Pacific, excuse me, Asia Pacific Security Chair Patrick Cronin, my colleague. Rick Scott has represented, represented Florida in the United States Senate since January of 2019. Senator Scott serves on the Armed Services Committee, the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, the Budget Committee, the Special Committee on Aging, and the Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. He's a busy man. Uh, throughout his tenure in the Senate, Senator Scott has been a vocal advocate for stronger policies to counter the geopolitical economic threats that China poses to the United States and our allies around the world. He is also one of Congress's chief critics of Beijing's human rights abuses and repression in, in Xinjiang province and in Hong Kong and throughout China. From 2011 to 2019, Senator Scott served as Florida's 45th governor. Prior to his election, the senator had an extensive career in business and as an entrepreneur. He is also a veteran of the United States Navy. Welcome, Senator Scott. It's my pleasure to, to invite you to come to the podium and make your remarks. Please join me in welcoming Senator Scott. John, thanks for the introduction. By the way, the budget sounds really impressive. The budget committee doesn't do anything. So if we did, we wouldn't have trillion dollar deficits and have, uh, have $23 trillion worth of debt. First off, it's, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to be here. Um, I want to thank Hudson Institute for the opportunity to be here. Before I begin, I want to say a few words about a friend, uh, Jimmy Lai. Uh, he was arrested this morning in Hong Kong along with some former lawmakers, Lee Chung Wan and Yong Sum. Uh, they were arrested for participating in peaceful protests against a repressive government that is denying the people of Hong Kong their basic rights. Jimmy and the other leaders of the peaceful protests should be honored for their commitment to freedom and human rights for Hong Kongers. Carrie Lam and the Chinese Communist Party should consider their next moves very, very carefully. I think every, we're all going to follow it, and hopefully our government will be uh, very responsive. Today, we're here to talk about the threat we face from communist China. And let's remember, it's communist China. We can't forget that. She, the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, is a dictator, a human rights violator who is denying basic rights to the people of Hong Kong, cracking down on dissidents, militarizing the South China Sea, and imprisoning more than one million Uyghurs in internment camps simply because of their religion. We cannot continue to pretend that General Secretary Xi is a world leader intent on pursuing policies of freedom, economic cooperation, and peace. He pursues policies that are good for the Chinese Communist Party, period. He is a despot in disguise, his Mao Zedong with a makeover. Unfortunately, the last few decades of policies coming out of Washington have not solved the problem of communist China. We merely, merely altered the battlefield. For ta far too long, since President Nixon traveled to communist China in 1972, the United States has pursued a policy of cooperation and integration. President Nixon's goal was to disassociate communist China from the Soviet Union and prevent their further intrusion into Southeast Asia. But as the decades marched on, policymakers in Washington convinced themselves that they could change communist China they could bring them into the world community. Some focus solely on strengthening the U.S. economy and expanding opportunity for American companies. Our relationship with Communist China was an opportunity to venture into new markets, new industries, and new wealth. On this front, some companies have seen great success in the short term, but others have watched that the Chinese government orchestrated the theft of intellectual property and ultimately their customers. For those whose focus was on spreading American values of freedom, democracy, and capitalism around the globe, the hope was that a relationship with communist China 
would naturally result in their adoption of our values. Many were convinced that they showed communist China and, their, and its people of a free market economy, of human rights and individual dignity, of a democratic system that respects the will of the people, that they would naturally move in our direction. It's time for policymakers in Washington to admit that this effort has been a complete failure. Rather than move communist China in, in the direction of democratic values, the policy of economic cooperation has simply given communist China the resources to compete with the United States on a global scale, all while they continue to nationalize industries, steal from U.S. companies, deny basic human rights, violently suppress dissent, and pursue policies of religious oppression. Our posture towards communist China has simply strengthened a determined adversary, one that views this conflict as a zero-sum game. They win, we lose. For Beijing, their goal of increasing influence around the world requires the United States and other freedom-loving countries to be weakened. Communist China does not want to join the community of nations so much as it wants to rule it. The result, whether we want to admit it or not, is there is a new Cold War. The threat today is not another nuclear annihilation. Rather, this is a Cold War focused on technology, inf misinformation, and political persuasion. As I've traveled around the world, I've seen Communist China global reach up close. In Panama, Communist China is building a port, their own port, to control the flow of goods in our hemisphere. In Argentina, Communist China is building a new nuclear power plant that the Argentine government doesn't need or want. Across Africa, Communist China is mining natural resources with the goal of furthering their control. And all around the world, Chinese state-sponsored national champion technology companies like Huawei expand their reach. Right here at home, we've, we've been faced with instances of Chinese infiltration into American research institutions with the goal of stealing sensitive, often taxpayer-funded research. Communist China's goal is to control as much of the region and the world as they can. We must be very clear-eyed about this, and we must restructure our global posture and national security apparatus to reflect this growing threat. Communist China's strategy is systematic and global. They're building up their military. They're subsidizing strategic industries. They're working to control natural resources. They're infiltrating weak economies and using their presence to exert political influence. They're applying more pressure in East Asia, particularly Hong Kong and Taiwan, while also expanding the reach all across the globe. They're building a surveillance state, both inside and outside of Communist China, to dominate and control the flow of information. Our commitment to peace, democracy, and human rights around the globe must be paired with an equally global strategy to deal with the growing threat of Communist China. What I've tried to focus on throughout my first year in the U.S. Senate is finding every opportunity possible to reveal communist China's true intentions and their fundamentally anti-democratic worldview. Our goal must be to untangle some of the missteps our government has made to protect the citizens of the United States and the long-term security of our economy. I introduced legislation that would prevent the federal government from purchasing drones made in communist China and other adversaries due to the national security threat. I introduced legislation that would prohibit intelligence sharing with countries to give Huawei access to their 5G networks. I introduced legislation that would prevent U.S. companies from selling component parts to Huawei and other Chinese-owned tech companies. I've supported a national defense strategy that reflects a commitment to combating the threat of Chinese military expansion. I fought to expose Chinese propaganda outlets like China Daily that collaborate with U.S. media companies to publish inserts appearing to be real news. I've urged U.S. research institutions and hospitals 
to take steps to safeguard sensitive technology and research, a push that has already resulted in high-profile institutions terminating employees who had undisclosed relationships with Communist China. I fought successfully to get the Peace Corps out of Communist China. I joined legislation to prevent federal retirement savings funds from being invested in Communist China. I was the first U.S. senator to visit Hong Kong after the protests began and supported the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, one of the few bipartisan accomplishments of this Congress. I also introduced legislation that would prevent U.S. companies from selling crowd control equipment to the Hong Kong police. I supported legislation to urge Taiwan's admittance into the WHO and have strongly support, support, voiced my support for continued arms sales to Taiwan. I've traveled to Latin America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East, urging countries to understand the threat from Communist China and not bow to their political and economic pressure. Over the last few years, we've seen a tectonic shift in the way policymakers view the problem of Communist China. It may be the only issue that both parties fundamentally agree on. We're taking the threat to our security and our way of life seriously, and that's progress. But there's a lot more to do. My hope is that discussions like these and those that are happening in the halls of Congress and in boardrooms across our country will further our goals of highlighting communist, communist China's aggression and to developing a comprehensive strategy to address this threat. Today, I've spent a lot of time talking about the geopolitical threat of communist China, a threat I think that's going to dominate the next century. We often talk about this threat in very abstract terms, but I want to conclude today by talking about the real people that are suffering in communist China. There is a human cost to the kind of anti-democratic, anti-religion, and anti-human rights regime that General Secretary Xi is leading in Communist China. I've traveled to Hong Kong and have spent many hours meeting with the leaders of the democratic protest. Many have been beaten, sexually harassed, or arrested simply for exercising the basic rights they were promised during the handover from Great Britain in 1997. Nathan Law was one of them. Nathan was one of the students that focused, founded Demosisto in 2016, and he co-founded the Network of Young Democratic Asians to promote exchanges among social activists. He was elected to the Legislative Council and became the youngest legislative counselor in history, only to see his seat overturned by Communist China. He was later jailed for his participation in the Umbrella Movement. I was honored to have Nathan as my guest at last month's State of the Union. Journalists have been imprisoned and expelled from the country for simply reporting the truth. One lost her eye to police violence. More than one million Muslim minorities are being held in internment camps simply because of their religion. Faced with re-education programs, isolation, isolation, and forced owner organ harvesting. In some instances, Communist China sent men to sleep in the same bed as Uyghur women, a disgusting act with no purpose other than to demean, degrade, and dehumanize. It's cruelty, plain and simple. It's barbarism. We can no longer pretend that Communist China is an ally with good intentions, merely a partner with customs or a political system that we don't fully understand. We know that Communist China is, we know what Communist China is, we know who they are. Communist China is a totalitarian regime bent on world domination, one that quashes dissent often violently and destroys anyone or anything that stands in its way. We all remember the brave man who stared down Chinese tanks in Tiananmen Square with no concern for his own life. The image was an inspiration to millions around the world who stood in solidarity with those students fighting for their basic human rights. He was nicknamed, nicknamed Tank Man, and we still don't know exactly what happened to him, but we should assume he was murdered by the Communist Chinese regime. Today in Communist China, we have thousands of images that reflect a continuation of this hero's resistance against despotic rule. It's a protest in Hong Kong. 
The journalists risking their lives and their safety to shine a light on injustice. The Uyghurs fighting back bravely in the, in the face of suffering. The politicians question Xi's leadership. The brave health workers who tried to warn us about the Chinese coronavirus. America stands with the freedom-loving people of Hong Kong and Taiwan. The historically persecuted people of Tibet. The peaceful community of Uyghur Muslims and Falun Gong. And the journalists and political dissidents in communist China. We stand for human rights and we stand against political neutrality in the face of evil. The challenge posed by communist China is great. We have to face this challenge head on. It will be the conflict that determines whether the world community will embrace the values of democracy and human rights or cower to the whims of dictators. I will fight every day to make sure we come down on the right side of history. Thank you. Senator, very powerful speech, and thank you very much for not only those words, but now being willing to spend a, a bit of extra time in conversation. The impressive thing about your speech to me was not just your passion, but you've enumerated so many specific examples, which I, my own research would cooperate. Those are all real. Um, but I, I work in a think tank, and I've been working on research in the region for a long time, and you've given a better speech than I could give. How did you come on China? What, how, did, how did this interest in China and this passion develop? First off, don't, wouldn't we all love to, that China would do the right thing and we could, you know, they could become part of the world community that would want to help uh, you know, to be a competitor but not an adversary, uh, somebody that doesn't want to have world domination? Here's the way I, I've always thought about it. I grew up in a very poor family. I lived in public housing. My, uh, I don't know my dad. Uh, my parents, you know, often my, I have an adopted dad, didn't have work. I remember when my dad got his car repossessed. What's China doing? They're intentionally stealing our jobs. They don't open up their markets. So number one, they're, not a, they're, they're, they're an adversary. They're not a, a legitimate competitor. They steal our jobs intentionally. They don't act responsibly. Um, number two, I have, I have family members that have been involved in drugs. What are they doing? They're selling fentanyl in this country. They can sit there and, they can sit there and know what everybody does through a social you know, you know, scoring, but gosh, they can't find that darn fentanyl that they're shipping into this country, killing American citizens. So if you, if you look, and then you just, you just you can't imagine what they're doing to the Uyghurs. Who could do that? How could you be that barbaric? And so if we don't stand up for the, if, if Americans don't stand up for freedom, democracy, human rights, who does? We are the leader, we, we are the leaders. And I think it's important for all of us to do it. I think we all have to understand when we buy a Chinese product, we are helping Xi focus on world domination. Every, every time we buy anything from China, we have to think about that. That's what we're doing. Senator, when we think about the uh, coronavirus outbreak right now that started in Wuhan and in China, uh, there's plenty to criticize Xi Jinping and the party, the Chinese Communist Party, for covering up the information flow, which contributed, I think, to the severity. But it is a pandemic, and we share that interest. How, how do you think about the coronavirus and China's role in the, in the CCP? Um, it's partly a shared interest in terms of pandemic, but at the same time, the party has a different priority, right? The Communist yeah. Party wants to save the party. We're, we're at least three months into this crisis with the coronavirus. Does anybody trust anything that comes out of China? No. I mean, the first time we're going to really have a chance to see what's the incubation period, you know, what's the mortality rate, you know, what can you do, it's really South Korea. South Korea is going to be, I believe they'll be transparent, but I don't believe there's anything that's coming out of China that's transparent. And so, uh, so it's, it's causing, it's, you know, is our CDC in, over in, in Wuhan? No, not allowed. Was the WHO being able to go over, the, over there and do their independent analysis? No, they had to do it with the Communist uh, Chinese Party. So I think they, they, and then not letting Taiwan, intentionally making sure Taiwan's not part of the WHO. I mean, this is about world health. And so it's, it's I'm, I'm very disappointed uh, they're not worried. They're not concerned about what happens to the world. They're, you know, they're very focused on staying in power. And we have, we have no earthly idea, actually, what you know, you know, you know uh, about anything with regard to the coronavirus based on what China's put out. It's inconsistent what they put out. 
it's a serious problem. Another serious problem, and one you've introduced legislation on, is the drone issue. I, I've seen China sale of drones in the Middle East, including killer drones. They can't, we can't compete even uh, with them in terms of how they no, operate. Because they subsidize the industry. Right. What, what about your good legislation? What are the obstacles or what are the challenges to trying to get this legislation over the bar, and, and not to mention surveillance technology and other technologies that maybe should be kept out of our economy? Well, the, 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 here's the positive. The positive is the Department of the Interior stopped. The positive is we got through the National Defense Authorization Act. The Department of Defense is not going to be buying Chinese drones. But we, you know, I, I haven't gotten enough support, in my opinion, out of um, you know, all the branches of the federal government. Um, I mean, the, the Chinese government, you know, they they are very smart. They they have they lobby and they, you know they uh, so we we're, we're I look, I believe everything we're doing will happen. It's just when and how long it's going to take. We if we just stay after it. I'm a business guy. If I stayed after what I wanted to get done in business, I got there. So the same with this. But you know, we're trying to get. You know, we're trying to get the State Department, trying to get you know everybody to uh, to support legislation, and it, it's work because you know there's still people that just think, oh gosh, if we're just really nice and we just engage, it'll all work out. Well, we've been doing that for a long time, and it hasn't worked out. I mean, wouldn't I mean I still I wish I wish the Communist China understood that they would be better off to be part of a world economy that they don't have to dominate. I mean, let everybody go compete, and the best person win. Don't, don't, don't do it the way they're doing, it where you have to steal and things like that. Well, one of the arguments would be that we need to provide alternatives as well. 5G is another area where we've been lagging behind. We've allowed China to kind of have its, cha its state yeah. champions like Huawei, and where have we been? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I think I think one thing we've got to do is we we have got to be better organized at. at at explaining what the alternatives are, um, we've got to have more discussions about it, what it, we really are going are to have. Not going to be able to share the same in, intelligence information with with Germany or with with the UK. And uh, Nigel Farage was over here um, this week, and that's one of the things he's focused on. The but you know we we're late to the game as far as talking about it. I think I think there's going to be plenty of alternatives. But we've got to get out there. We've got to promote it. We have to, you know, what I did as governor when I wanted to promote something, I hold a conference and try to get people to start talking to each other. You don't have to have government doesn't have to go run things. You have to get people to cooperate. Senator, you're right, and you've got that business experience as well as running the state. And now at the Senate, you have an ability to kind of tax the administration, the executive branch, to audit themselves, right, and even right. to find out what they're doing or what they should be doing, and, and inform the Congress so that you can make. Meaningful legislation. Yeah, I mean, part of I mean, it's, it's great to be on some of the committees I'm on uh, because you you have good oversight and and in the way this the way my experience in this job and I've I've had this job for 14 months is is if you know if you if you are logical and you continue to ask questions and you continue to push and push and push, then you know people start you know they start listening they start reacting and that's been our experience. It was. I mean, I don't know why we were why the Peace Corps was in Hong Kong they were, or in uh, Communist China. We're getting no return, and so you know, it you know took a few months, but you know they're not there anymore. They there was no return on it. Um, so I just um, my job is is and I tell people this is you know these jobs are fleeting. Uh, I have this job for you know at least six years, and if you have ideas of how I can get messages out, I mean. And as a U.S. senator, you have the opportunity to, to travel the world to get your message out, and that's what I'm committing to do. But if anybody has ideas of how I can get this message out better, I'm willing to do it. But I'm, we have got we have got to uh, compete against uh, these Chinese companies that are trying to surveil us and trying to control our data. Um, so, and not just from a government standpoint, from your standpoint, do you want your all your data out there uh, where the Chinese government's going to have it? I don't. Senator, one of the challenges here with dealing with China is because they are such an integral part of the global economy. This question of decoupling kind of pits the national security professionals versus the businessmen and women. You, you've been both in national security and business. So how do you see decoupling and, and the possibility or what we have to do here to, to disentangle ourselves on critical technologies at a minimum? I think, I think unfortunately, because of, of it's not because of America and what we're doing. It's because of what communist Chinese is, China is doing. I think there is going to be more decoupling. I, I think we're seeing it with the coronavirus. Or I think people are saying to themselves, "Are we too dependent on on a in a 
a country that acts as an adversary. And I think there's, I think there's, that's going to cause some people to rethink their supply chains. But I think when people sit and say to themselves, do, do I want to support a regime that does, has the human rights record that the Communist Party has in China, I think people are going to say, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So I think that's going to cause more of the decoupling. So China can change. China can be a competitor rather than an adversary. Um, I, I mean, I hope they do. Um, but I think it's going to happen. I, I think, unfortunately, that's the path we're going down. And people are going to have to choose. Do you? And and I choose one. I want more jobs in this country. I don't want I don't want people selling more fentanyl in this country. I don't want China to try to militarize the whole the rest of the world. I mean, they lied to Obama on the Ch South China Sea. So and and we have we are it. We're it. We're the ones going to stand up for human rights. If this country doesn't, who does? Indeed. Uh, the South China Sea, Xi Jinping promised President Obama he wouldn't militarize the South China Sea. He didn't build. What have they ever done that they agreed <laughs> to do? That, that they, I mean, it's like, it's like this new trade deal. Right. I would love to do more trade with China. Yes. We all would. How many of us believe they're going to comply? It's a great question. On, when you deal with the American system, though, we're a big, open, inclusive system. Our, you, you've run a state. I'm a, I'm a proud native of Florida. Um, but I don't pretend to think that uh, my hometown of Sarasota or my university town in Gainesville um, could protect us from China's intrusions. They're, they're exploiting our open system, our universities, our research lab, our businesses. So how can, how can you now in the Senate and the national government help our states and local communities and governments clamp down on a malign behavior and exploitation? Well, I think, I think first off, Americans don't want China to steal our stuff. So we started talking to our, our universities and, and our hospitals and already in Florida and you're seeing around the country that they're, they're looking into it and people have had been held accountable. You saw Moffitt Cancer Center, they let three of the top people go because they had undisclosed relationships with communist China. And so I think that's going to happen. There's a, you know, other people are, are proposing legislation, uh, but, but I, be, I believe that Americans uh, were, more, were innovative. I mean, we, uh, we, will, we will win if we understand what the challenge is. And so, but I'm going I'm to continue to make sure, and I know there's others that are going to try to make sure that hospitals, our universities are all thinking about, um, you know, China's commitment to steal, steal our, you know, all, it's not just business information, but taxpayer information. And one of the challenges with the Communist Party's sort of activities is that they'll go wherever the opportunity is. So if it's the Caribbean, they'll send Belt and Road Initiative money, yeah. and then they'll say, by the way, a military relationship should now follow. The PLA should come in. Um, what about our own hemisphere, you know, more broadly in terms of China's activities? Well, you know, the building, the, you know, unnecessarily and, and without disclosing all the information, you know, they're building um, the, uh, down at the Panama Canal, um, they're building the terminal, terminals down there. Uh, they are, I was, I, was, I was down there talking to them, I was, I was in Argentina, they're building, uh, Communist China is building a nuclear plant that the government doesn't want. Um, the, uh, they're helping Maduro uh, down in uh, Venezuela and he's committing genocide against his citizens, you see these little kids starving to death. They can't get medicine. They can't get water. They can't get food. If you if you want to go see something close, that's a, just an unbelievable crisis. Go to Cucuta in in, um, in Colombia, and you see these young moms with two or three kids that are sleeping on the streets. Um, and thank God for USAID and and, and the um, the Catholic uh, Catholic charities because they're running a, um, a place that they serve. Uh, about 5,000 meals a day. So a lot, of these, a lot of these little kids and moms are getting one meal a day, and they're waiting three or four hours for it. Um, and, and, and Communist China is helping Maduro down there. So they're, they're here. We have, to, we have to understand that they are infiltrating our hemisphere. And, and every problem that happens in Latin America ultimately happens in America. I mean, they're... I mean, you know, they, they, it, it helps people like Hezbollah come to, come to our hemisphere. Indeed, you've mentioned several times the, the fentanyl crisis, which preys upon it and creates further the opioid crisis in our country. China pretends or offers some assistance. Maybe they did actually provide some assistance, but unfortunately, they don't stop looking over here. Or, or, and yeah, how are you it, looking at Has this? it stopped? 
No, I mean, we, it doesn't stop. You know, we, have, we, we only have five international mail centers, mm -hmm. and you know, there's so much mail that comes in through China, we can't check every package. And I was, I was down at the mail center down in Miami, mm -hmm. uh, which is like the fourth busiest. I mean, every day they're finding um, uh, illegal drugs coming in from China, every day. And, uh, and they're not, um, and, and they're able to, to, to track it better because they don't have as much mail as some of the other mail centers have that are even busier. So, I mean, this, in my, I don't think there's any question. When you look at how, how Communist China runs their economy, this is all intentional. They know where this stuff is made. And so it's, they're, it's intentional. Everything they do is very systematic and very intentional. And we love them to change. We love to, you know, just go compete. I, I'm a business guy. I love to compete. You know, just you know, make sure the rules are fair. I'll do everything I can to win. You've uh, graphically described even some of the horrors in Xinjiang, for instance, that the Uyghurs have suffered. Um, but our Peace Corps does good work around the world in tough zones. But, yep. you know, why have you been so passionate about trying to get our Peace Corps out of there and succeeding in doing so? Sure. Well, I think, I think we're running trillion dollar deficits in this country. We cannot waste our money. When I was governor of Florida, I walked in with a $4 billion budget deficit my first year. I balanced the budget. And by the time I left, we were running $3 billion uh, surpluses because we looked at how we spent every dollar. There are 4,000 lines to the state budget, and it's about an $87 billion budget. My goal was on every line we had to get a return. I believe that about our federal money. It's somebody's tax money. So, I, so I've been going piece by piece around um, to different agencies and said, what do we get for it? What do we get for it? So, so I, I asked the uh, individuals running the Peace Corps to come in and tell me, what are we getting for being in China? I first said, what, why are we there? They said, because we were asked. I said, it's not a developing country. I mean, they're, they're working hard to take all of our jobs. I said, so what do you do there? They, they said, we teach English. I said, so how does that help us? I said, do you teach capitalism? Do you teach, do you work with the State Department? Do you work with the Department of Commerce? No, we don't work with anybody. I said, somebody might, they said, somebody might talk about it, but we don't have any plan to do that. We just teach English. That's all we do. I said, so, like, what, so how much you spend? They weren't sure. I said, so what, tell me exactly what we get for it. They had no answer. There was no answer what we got for it. So how we, how, what, that's somebody's money. We're taxing our citizens. We should expect to get a return on every dollar we spend. And so, so um, I said, if you, don't, if you can't tell me that we're getting a return, then we ought to, you ought to get out. And uh, then, they, then they said, well, maybe somebody could go to work for the State Department. I said, great. I said, has that ever happened? Not that we know of. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. I mean, I could, when I was governor, I could tell you stories because what happens, we have so many wonderful people to work in our government. But often, no one's thinking about why are we doing what we're doing. Maybe it made sense 20 years ago, but why are we doing it today? And I think this was an example. Maybe it made sense 25 years ago for the Peace Corps to be there. But when they're, when they're you know, impacting our jobs, they don't open up their markets, we're not teaching capitalism, we have no example of where something could happen, why are we doing it? Let's stop. We have limited means. We have to protect our national security. And we've been doing such good humanitarian work, we assume it will be repaid. But unfortunately, there's some places that are just not worth investing it's in. Not. Why are we doing it? And we're running trillion dollar deficits. Indeed. Somebody's going to pay for these deficits. Now, w one person who's paying are the, you know, the tuition that's coming in from Chinese students. I'm thinking University of California, San Diego, where one fourth of the student body is from China. A lot of tuition. So there's a lot of pressure and pushback from universities. And we subsidize every student. Indeed. Think about what we're doing. We subsidize all the students. So we're subsidizing the education for, for the people that are coming in. So, so when I became governor, we were raising tuition in Florida and in our universities 15% every year, plus inflation. Who can stay up with that? I mean, it made no sense. And then I said, I, I asked them, I said, tell me your survey. Do people get jobs? Oh, we don't do surveys like that. How much money do they make? We don't do surveys like that. I said, you're crazy. And so, so I, I, I changed the funding to 20% of the budget, $580 million a year out of our uh, 11 universities in Florida. They get, they get money tied to three things. 
What's it cost to get a degree? We now have the second lowest tuition in the country. Do you get a job? How much money do you make? And so now, if you look at US News Report, Florida now has the number one higher education system in the country. And if you're a Gator fan, the University of Florida is number seven uh, in the country. And they'll be in the top five within, uh, within two years. Because we set up, what are we, what are we doing this for? Let's get a return on it. It's somebody's money. We're subsidizing this. It's not, the tuition doesn't cover all of it. We are subsidizing this. If we're subsidizing it, you should expect your tax, tax dollars to get a return. I'll be lecturing at my alma mater in, in Gainesville in just a couple of weeks, so I'll have to bring that fact up. Um, They're number seven now. They're Senator, that's a, that's a good achievement um, for a place that, when I was there, they said this is a suntan university. So we're, you know, we've come a long way. Um, some of those Chinese students, not you know, kidding aside, um, you know, literally one taking photographs outside of the naval installation at Key West. What is, right. what is that all about? I mean, you know, <laughs> the law in China is if you're a Chinese citizen, you're, by law, you have to spy for China. If they tell you they want information, you have to go get it. That's, your, that's the law of that country. I mean, think about this. I mean, would, would we, if, if every American knew what the communist China was doing and what their laws required them to do, we would have a totally different approach. And part of my job is I'm gonna do I'm gonna I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure everybody in the country knows this, with the hope that maybe China will completely change. So they haven't they haven't so far. But yeah, they're they're stealing our technology. Um, I mean, we we pay for this. We pay for I mean we're spending all this money of whether it's NIH dollars or what we're putting into our universities, all these research dollars, and then they just go steal it. Senator, I know your time is short. And just in terms of wrapping up this great discussion, I wish we had more time. I mean, what, what is it that um, you'd like to see America stand for in this time that we live in? You know, I, I'm, um, I believe we ought to stand one for human rights. I think we are, we, we are the, the one place um, that you know, we believe every individual's life is important. And, and so even though the Uyghurs don't live in, in the United States, their lives are just as important as all of ours. And so I want a country um, and, a, and a population that really believes that. And then I, I think about the kids like me growing up that their parents struggle for work. They got to have the same shot I had. I grew up in this country at a time where you could, you could get a job. But if you look at it, what's happened, and while we have a really good economy now, I mean, some, there's a lot of the jobs that China's taken. And, and they've taken it not because they were good competitors, but because they did things that were wrong. And we've got we to we gotta stop that. We need to do trade deals, but they've got to be fair to Americans. They've got to be fair to American taxpayers. They've got to be fair to American workers. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight um, for, the, for these things. And then the primary purpose of the federal government is to make sure we continue to have our Bill of Rights and our way of government. That's not what China wants. China wants to dominate the world. That's how they're acting. I, want my, I, have, I have grandkids. I got married really young. I have, I have six grandsons, a granddaughter on the way. I want them to live in a country where they say that they can, they can you know, they get the same rights that I grew up with. And, um, and we're going to have to fight for it. And hopefully we don't have, it won't be, it won't be a military fight, but we're only going to, that's only going to happen is if we can fund our military and China quits putting all the money to, to try to defeat our military. So, but thank you again for the opportunity to be thank here. Thank you, Senator, and good luck with Happy this. Day. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the Senator. Thank you. Well done. Thanks a lot. Thank you.